Hi guys, I'm Miss Cherry again. Hey, I just wanted to visit with you a little bit about congestive heart failure. You are definitely going to take care of people that have this condition and generally when they have this condition they're pretty sick. So I think it's valuable to know what it is and what causes the signs and symptoms that you're going to see. So just a little note for me, this is what I look like so you have a name to go with the face. Um, I just wanted to real quick tell you thank you for watching the videos and you know if you find it valuable drop me a comment. If you don't drop me a comment too because I really want to make something that's valuable to you guys and will help you out help you to be better EMTs and paramedics. So thanks for watching. Okay now we're talking about congestive heart failure. So doesn't it make sense that if we're going to be talking about heart failure that we should know how a heart is supposed to work when it's not failing. It's kind of like if I'm going to go work on my pickup truck outside, um, I probably should know how it was supposed to work when it came from the manufacturer. Otherwise, I am never going to be able to troubleshoot the problem and fix it. Okay, so we're going to talk about the real basic function of the heart here. Um, so I hope you guys can see my little cursor. Um, so our, our heart has four chambers and it's got some valves in here and we're not going to worry about the valves today. We're just going to worry about this flow of the heart. Okay, now the heart has a right and left atrium and a right and left ventricle. The right side of the heart brings in and processes deoxygenated blood. So this is blood from the body that's come back. The cells have already taken the oxygen out of it and it's really coming back to get refueled. Okay. Now it comes in from the vena cava, the superior from the top part of our body and the inferior and both of them drop right in here into this right atrium. Okay. Now this is a little valve here and when the heart isn't contracting that valve is open. So the blood comes in and it really just kind of feeds right down in here to this big old ventricle um, by gravity. Okay now once this deoxygenated blood comes in and it fits in this um, ventricle, when the ventricle gets ready to pump this valve closes, this contracts and it squeezes the blood up here into the pulmonary arteries. Now you'll notice there's one that goes this way and there's one that goes this way. There's a pulmonary artery that goes to each lung. Okay, So this is pumping the blood out to the lungs to go get oxygenated so it's going to be useful again. Okay, Now it goes out to the lungs via these two arteries. Keep in mind arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Okay, um, And then after it goes around into the lungs, we're going to talk about that process in just a second, then it comes back in through the pulmonary veins and you see there's a pulmonary vein, or there's actually a couple of them, that come in from each lung. They're going to come in and both of them dump this good oxygen rich blood because it went out to the lungs, it gathered up the oxygen, kicked off its carbon dioxide, and now we have this nice red rich blood that comes into the vent, uh, left atrium, down through this valve, same process as over here, down through the valve and into the left ventricle. Now this one is the pumping station to the body, and so when this left ventricle contracts, it squishes the blood right up here. Now for a long time I had no idea that the blood left the ventricles at the top. So um, you know if you didn't know that either we can both learn together. Okay, So it squeezes it up and out the aorta. Now the aorta is that high pressure artery that services the entire body. Okay so it squishes that right out there. Okay that's pretty simple in a nutshell. Um, Here's a little tidbit for you though, and this is something I didn't know until I got a little deeper into cardiology. Um, both sides of the heart, even though the left ventricle is a little more muscular because it has more 
miles to pump the blood, both of them pump the same amount of blood with each contraction. And so if they do that, like a normal healthy heart does, then we have balance. The right and left are pumping at the same time and they're both moving blood. So they're moving blood through the lungs and out the aorta. So if this one's pumping a cup of blood, this one's pumping a cup of blood and everything moves smoothly, much like an interstate. If everybody's going 65 miles an hour, the traffic moves well. But if you've got a semi that's moving 35, that's going to cause some backup and that's going to cause some problems. And that's what's going to happen to our heart if this happens. So again, look, you can see here as this pumps out the right atrium, there's a uh, pulmonary artery, I mean the right ventricle, good Lord, pulmonary artery that goes to each lung. And there's pulmonary veins that bring that blood back from the lungs. Okay, so once we get to the lungs, now here's, here's that um, pulmonary artery bringing that deoxygenated blood. It's going to come down and it comes down into smaller and smaller and smaller branches. Um, this candy cane looking thing is actually your bronchioles, okay? Um, and these are your little alveoli, those tiny little air sacs. And you can see how they have capillaries wrapped around them. You can also see how it's blue, and then as it wraps around this capillary, it turns red because it's picking up oxygen. We get that gas exchange right there. This is critical, and the important stuff that happens, happens at the capillary level. Those tiny, tiny little one cell thick capillaries play such a huge part. Okay, so let's talk about what happens if our heart gets damaged? Because that's what we're talking about, congestive heart failure, okay? So if our heart gets damaged, let's say this patient had a heart attack, okay? And he had a blockage in one of the arteries inside his cardiac muscle. And part of his cardiac muscle, let's say in the left ventricle, let's say right over here, um, those cells died because they didn't get oxygenated for um, a, a while and, and they died. So now what we have is we have a right side of the heart that's still healthy and pumping away. It's still pumping the same amount of blood as it did before we had our heart attack. But the left side, that pump is broken. It's not gonna pump the same amount. It's gonna be that 35 mile an hour semi on the interstate. Okay, so when that right ventricle bumps the blood out to the lungs and it goes to come back into the left ventricle and it gets down in here and yeah, not very much happens. So now we've got blood backing up. Okay, if this left ventricle can't pump out everything that the right ventricle is pumping to it, that blood is going to start to back up and it's gonna back up into the left atrium, and then it's gonna back up into these pulmonary veins. Now remember, those are bringing blood from the lungs. Well, once these get full, it's gonna to continue to back up until it backs up around um, those tiny capillaries, okay? So now we get this, this blood is backing up here, and we're getting off balance. We're getting a backup, okay? Now, you guys have probably heard the term homeostasis. Um, that's a term that you, you should know. It's what the body is always trying to achieve. And homeostasis, in essence, means a state of balance. Um, things are equal. Because if our body can keep itself in balance, it will function better. Well, what we have is a disruption in our homeostasis because these little guys are getting blood backed up because that left ventricle can't pump the blood out. So it's come up here, it's got oxygenated, and then when it gets here, 
we're meeting that traffic jam. And the pressure inside these little red capillaries is building. The pressure inside the blue ones is not yet. So we got to fix this. Okay. Now, here's what's going to happen. Here's our little capillary. Here's our alveoli, our little air sac. Okay. Pressure is building up in the capillary. That blood is backing up from the pump, from the heart, and it's building. The pressure is not changing inside the alveoli because our patient's still breathing normally. So we got to fix that. Okay. And to do that, we're going to have to look at this capillary. Okay. I got to move my little thing out of the way. Okay. So inside the capillary, it's important that we know what's in there so we can figure out how this is going to work. Okay. We have white blood cells. They're right here. They're kind of chunky. We have platelets and that's those little clotting things kind of look like little Velcros. Um, they're kind of chunky. We have red blood cells, nice big red discs that carry the oxygen. Those are also chunky. They all play an important part. But we also have the plasma, the water, okay? The water that all of those other components of the bud float in, okay? Now, we're not gonna be able to move that chunky stuff through the membrane of that capillary. Um, but if we don't change something, the pressure is going to get so big or so high in that little capillary um, and those other vessels that we're going to have disastrous effects. So the reason that this happens in the capillary level is because this is where the vein walls are the thinnest. And so we're going to have to move something out of this high pressure area into the low pressure area to achieve homeostasis. I don't know if you've ever seen your grandma or your mom make tomato juice. And I know probably nobody in the world does this anymore, but bear with me, okay? So grandma takes the tomatoes, she cooks them down, there's some pulp in there, there's maybe a few seeds, maybe a little bit of skin uh, peeling from the tomatoes and she cooks it all down. And she's got like this nice, thick, rich, almost a soup looking um, substance. Well, to get the tomato juice out, she's going to pour that into a cheesecloth. Okay, and a cheesecloth is kind of a, a, a not really thick woven cloth. So she's going to pour this in here and then either by gravity or sometimes she might squeeze it just a little bit. She's going to force the juice, the water, the tomato juice, out of that and that's what she's going to can for tomato juice okay now the reason that the water goes through the cheesecloth and the rest of the chunky stuff doesn't is simple physics okay water will move through things easier than things of a thicker substance water is sort of the equalizer and that's the same thing that's going to happen here when this pressure in here gets high because it's building up at the capillary level, that water, you can see it right over here, is going to move out of there and right out into the tissues around it to equalize those pressures. Okay, now keep that concept in mind. So when things get off balance, keep moving my thing here, um, when things get off balance, the plasma or the water is the easiest and fastest substance that will move. So um, if you get concentrations that are off, and this is, this is more at the paramedic level, but if you get, let's say you've got um, outside the vessel has a real high salt content and inside doesn't, we don't have homeostasis. So the body will move water across until we balance that out, okay? And we balance that out by diluting the salt with the water. Okay, now that's a little, that's a little more advanced and it has nothing to do with congestive heart failure. But the same thing happens with pressure. We'll move the water across until we equal out the pressure. Another way you can think about this, if you've had an air tank, okay, um, if you've got an air tank, and let's say I'm going to put 85 pounds of pressure in my air tank. 
and I'm going to take it out to the farm and I'm going to um, try and put some air in my car tire with this air tank. Okay, and my car tire will hold 34 pounds of pressure. So if I put this air tank in, um, it's going to move air from the tank. I hook it up to the tire, the flat tire. It'll move air from the tank into the tire until they are balanced, until the pressure in the tank equals the pressure in the tire and then it won't move anymore. You won't be able to get any more pressure from the tank to the tire because there's nothing to push it. It's equal. That's what we're going for with this condition. We want to move the fluid out until these pressures are equalized. And so we're going to use the water to do that. I hope this is making sense. Okay. Okay, so when the water this is a really simple picture. This is our capillary at the bottom here, okay? When the water moves out of the capillary, across that capillary wall, it's gonna move um, around and sometimes into the alveoli, okay? Now, if it moves around, that in and of itself is a little bit detrimental because it keeps that alveoli, like alveoli, <laughs> from expanding like it should when we inhale. If the water moves into that air sac, then um, our patient is literally drowning, okay? He's got water in his lungs um, and he can't breathe through that. We can't get that gas exchange if our air sac, our little alveoli is full of water. Okay? So when the hydrostatic pressure, hydro meaning water and typically the water is in our vessels okay that's where it should be anyway when that pressure becomes greater than the osmotic pressure okay so this is the pressure inside the vessel pushing out and the osmotic pressure again please don't worry about remembering these names um, you need to be familiar but you need to know the concept okay the osmotic pressure is the pressure outside the vessel pushing in. So when this is greater than this, we're going to move water out. And that's what's happening in our congestive heart failure patient. And it is creating what we call pulmonary edema, swelling in the lungs. Okay? That's not really swelling, it's just fluid where it shouldn't be. Okay, So this is the, the concept behind this, and we're going to see how that plays through. So if the left ventricle is damaged, I'm gonna see blood back up into the capillaries in the lungs. And when that pressure gets great enough, the water is gonna shift out of the capillary into the lungs. And it's gonna cause pulmonary edema. I'm gonna have a patient with wet lungs. I'm gonna hear crackles when I hear this my patient's going to tell me that they're having a hard time breathing because they're literally drowning, okay? Okay, so let's look. Now we know when this left side is damaged that the blood's going to back up through the pulmonary veins back into the lungs and cause pulmonary edema. But let's see what happens when the right side is damaged, okay? Now we know the concepts, they don't change just because it's a different part of the heart. So if this right side can't pump everything that the vena cava is bringing in, then that blood is gonna back up, uh, it's gonna fill up this right ventricle, it's gonna fill up the right atrium, and it's gonna start to back up in that vena cava, okay? Now, that means the pressure is going to build in the vena cava. Now, if, if this picture were a little bigger, you'd see the vena cava is going to have the jugular veins come down and fill into it. You're going to have um, vessels from the inferior side of the body, the lower part of the body, feed into that. And so what you're going to see, you see right here, is jugular vein distension. That is the blood 
backing up from the right side of that heart as it's trying to fill. This vein's job is to be, bring deoxygenated blood from the head back down to the heart. But that heart isn't pumping on that right side effectively, and so this blood is backing up. Now, when patients are laying down, most of us will have JVD, but sitting up, we should not. So if you're seeing this in a patient that's sitting up 45 degrees or more, um, there's usually a heart issue there, usually a right-sided heart failure. Okay. See how easy that is in your diagnosing cardiac conditions. Okay. Now, I found this picture absolutely fascinating. Um, what they have done is they have taken um, a a corpse that somebody donated to science and they filled all of the vessels with a plastic type substance and then they used acid and they got rid of the tissue so this is literally capillaries in the in the body not capillaries but vessels in the body so you can see the heart right here you can see the aorta see how it comes up and it's got that aortic arch you can see how we've got those carotid arteries coming off the top of there and they're going up the neck and that's where we check our carotid pulse. Okay. Um, you can see the aorta, it goes up, it curves, and then it comes down. It comes down into the abdomen and then into two femoral arteries down here. Um, and right here you can see there's tons of capillaries and little vessels there because that's your liver. Okay. Um, and uh, so the liver sits right there and it's obviously and there's a spleen um, our lungs are up here our lungs are really very tiny in comparison to the whole chest and everybody thinks your lungs go clear down to your belly button and they don't okay so that's a little side note but I think that is so cool okay so when our pressure okay um, builds up from our heart. Remember from the right side of the heart, it's building up into the jugular vein, the vena cava. It's gonna build up in all of these capillaries in our body too. Now the same thing is gonna happen. When we get more pressure in the vessel than we have in the tissues around it, fluid will shift. And so what happens with these patients, if they have right-sided heart failure, the fluid shifts into the tissues in the body. And this is how we see it. Along with JVD, you may very likely see what we call peripheral edema or pitting edema in their lower extremities. So that fluid moves out into the tissues and then gravity takes over here. And that fluid sort of shifts to the lowest part. Um, if you can push on somebody's tissues and your fingerprint stays, that is edema. That's not fatty tissue. That is swelling. Okay? Um, and so when you're doing your medical assessment, always look at their ankles. If they've got swollen ankles, then we have right-sided heart failure. If it's bilateral, unless they've got an injury, but um, if that's just their norm, that's usually heart failure. Okay? That is absolutely worth looking at. Okay, so to wrap this up quick, because I've been talking way too long, um, congestive heart failure is going to present with fluid in the lungs, fluid around the lungs, if it's left-sided heart failure. We're going to have swollen uh, feet. They generally don't have great circulation because they are so swollen. Um, and our patients are going to tell us that they feel short of breath. Now, generally, if one side of the heart fails, the other side has an, a, a huge workload on it, and it eventually is going to fail too. So frequently, we're going to see both of those signs with our patients that have had congestive heart failure for very long. Okay, so big thing we're going to get called to is shortness of breath. Okay, it's going to happen more when they're working hard or working under a load and it is always going to happen at night when these patients go to lay down laying down makes that water kind of spread out in their lungs and they can't breathe 
So you'll see these patients that sleep in recliners or sit, sleep piled up on multiple pillows because laying flat is just too dis uncomfortable. Okay. Um, they'll feel weak and fatigued because they're not able to get the oxygen moved into their blood because there's water in their lungs. So they're hypoxic a lot of the time. They're going to have swelling in their legs and feet. They may have a rapid and irregular heartbeat simply because the heart is failing. Okay. Um, if they've got fluid in or around their lungs, they may have um, a pretty persistent cough. And they oftentimes will cough up a f uh, either phlegm that's kind of pink. It's blood tinged. It's got a little bit of blood. Those capillaries are bursting. Um, so a little bit of uh, pinkish phlegm. Or, if you look down here, uh, sometimes it's a pink foamy mucus, and oftentimes we call that um, frothy sputum, and sometimes that is pink too. But really what's happening is they're breathing through this fluid in their lungs, and there's a lining inside the lungs, and when you breathe through that water, that coating inside the lungs sort of mixes with the water, and it gets foamy, kind of like putting dish soap in water and then blowing bubbles through it, it's going to get foamy. And that's what that frothy sputum is, is they're, they're coughing up the foam from the water they're trying to breathe through. Okay. Sometimes they'll tell you they have, they've had rapid weight gain from fluid retention. Um, and in really bad cases, sometimes you get this real severe swelling in the abdomen to the point that they look like they're very pregnant. And we call that ascites. Um, so these patients are really sick. Um, the treatment for this, if it is in your scope of practice, um, if we've got fluid in the lungs, which is almost always the case when we get there, get called, um, is CPAP. And so what CPAP is going to do is it's going to put more pressure in the alveoli to push that fluid back out across. So we're going to use the CPAP to reverse the rolls here. So we'll put more pressure in the lungs. Now it's not a ton, it's just a little bit. We're going to put more pressure in the lungs. It'll, because now we've got more pressure in the lungs, it'll push that fluid right out of the alveoli and now our patient can breathe again. Uh, it's an amazing thing. If you don't have CPAP or aren't trained on it, I strongly encourage you to do some research on that and see how awesome it is. Um, the machines aren't expensive, and uh, it absolutely saves people's lives. So that is congestive heart failure. I hope you learned something. I hope it provided you um, a little bit of insight that you didn't have before. And uh, drop me a note. Have a great night. Take care.